Uh, so I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, condensation uh, of magnons, um, very similar to what uh, Burkert was talking about. But uh, in this case, um, the condensation will be driven not by microwave uh, 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 photon pumping, but by uh, temperature gradients um, applied to the YIG film. So this is a collaborative project uh, in collaboration with the group of Min Zong Wu, who has grown very nice ultra-thin YIG samples for us, and Yaroslav, uh, who is uh, helping us with uh, theory of these processes that I'm going to talk about. OK, so um, I will be talking about uh, thermal transport and magnetization dynamics in uh, ultra-thin YIG films, which are interfaced with a platinum film. So in, the, in such a system, uh, you have spin currents. Even in thermal equilibrium, you have spin currents that flow across the interface. So first of all, you have fluctuations of magnetization in EEG, which are driven by temperature. And these fluctuations of magnetization result in spin pumping and injection of spin current uh, into the platinum uh, layer uh, through the spin pumping mechanism. Uh, of course, in thermal equilibrium, you have a backflow current that flows from platinum to YIG. You have uh, uh, spin accumulation here, and you have thermal fluctuations and magnon, uh, uh, and basically spin flip scattering events that couple to the YIG magnetization through spin mixing conductance at the interface. So in thermal equilibrium, these two currents flowing between platinum and YIG are equal to each other, and you, know, you have equilibrium. Uh, uh, so in this case, of course, also the electron temperature, which determines the magnitude of the current that flows from platinum to YIG, is equal to the temperature of uh, magnons in YIG, which determine uh, the pumping, uh, spin pumping current that flows to platinum. So now if you apply a temperature gradient uh, across uh, uh, the interface, uh, across such a bi bilayer, you can uh, have now uh, different temperatures of electrons in platinum, for example, higher than the magnon temperature in YIG. <coughs> and in this case, the balance of spin currents uh, is broken, and you can have uh, a net spin current which is flowing from platinum into the YIG. OK, so what can we expect from um, such a net spin current, which is injected by a temperature gradient into the YIG uh, film. So the theory of uh, what can happen was developed in these um, uh, works by Scott Bender and co-workers. Um, and uh, what you can expect uh, is actually kind of anti-damping action of this uh, spin current, which is injected from platinum to YIG. And if this anti-damping becomes large enough, then you can expect uh, condensation of, uh, uh, of magnons in YIG into the lowest energy state, coherent lowest energy state. So let me just briefly describe what this uh, theory is about. So because you have uh, a net spin, cur net spin current uh, injected from platinum into YIG through spin flip processes uh, and uh, uh, interfacial spin mixing conductance, you generate incoherent magnons in YIG. So you generate a cloud of incoherent magnons. Then uh, through uh, nonlinear scattering processes, most notably for magnon scattering processes that Burkhardt has described uh, very well in his talk, you have a relaxation and you can example can have uh, the following types of scattering where you scatter from two incoherent magnons into um, a coherent low uh, frequency uh, state. Basically, you can, you can scatter into the lowest frequency state. And um, uh, this type of scattering generates, uh, basically increases the population of magnons in this uh, low frequency state. Uh, and acts as effective negative damping, essentially. So basically, the process goes as for, follows. You create uh, a cloud of incoherent magnons. There are relaxation processes inside of this cloud. 
uh, you raise the chemical potential and increase the density of magnons, and when the density reaches certain critical value, you can have condensation uh, into the lowest frequency state, lowest energy state, basically, which will manifest itself as macroscopic occupation uh, of magnons of this low frequency state with a well-defined phase. So it will be a coherent uh, state, which is um, uh, basically can be described as magnonic condensate. So that is uh, theory in the nutshell. And uh, uh, now let me talk about um, uh, the phase diagram uh, of uh, this system. Uh, so again, uh, what I'm showing here is a simplified version of the phase diagram uh, developed by um, Yaroslav and co-workers. And this phase diagram tells you what happens in this system uh, of uh, thin YIG film or uh, any insulating ferromagnet and uh, 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 basically non-magnetic metal, in our case platinum, when you apply either a temperature gradient across uh, this interface or you create a uh, spin accumulation in platinum by some other means. Uh, most easily this is done by spin hole effect. When you apply charge current along the platinum and you generate spin accumulation due to spin hole effect at the interface. So there are these two knobs that you can turn is basically apply spin hole current, create spin accumulation or apply temperature gradient. And basically the phase diagram tells you that there are two uh, main states that you can observe. So if you don't have uh, any spin accumulation or temperature gradient, you have your ferromagnet in the normal state, uh, 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 basically uh, just uh, excited by thermal fluctuations. But if you uh, uh, create su sufficient spin accumulation, uh, apply large spin hole current or apply temperature gradient, then you can drive, uh, then you can in in induce the condensate uh, basically, uh, you can create macroscopic occupation of the lowest energy state with well-defined phase. And this manifests itself as self-oscillations of uh, magnetization in YIG that you can experimentally observed, observe. So basically, this line, this horizontal line in the phase diagram has been studied quite well right now. Uh, so you can apply spin hole uh, current and you can cross this line and excite self-oscillations of magnetization. Uh, the first observation of this effect was done in Professor Saito's group and now there are uh, a couple of other groups, including my group, that observe this in ultra-thin YIG films. So now uh, this has been studied very well. Uh, our goal and uh, the subject of my talk is the transition across this line where you move uh, along some other direction on this phase diagram, uh, maybe close to the vertical direction. Okay, so um, the control, and, and as, as I mentioned, if you apply um, uh, this, uh, uh, if you consider this mechanism where you apply a pure spin current uh, to YIG, which either uh, results from spin hole current or uh, from thermal current driven by temperature gradient, so uh, can be called spin Seebeck current, then you can tune the effective damping of the low frequency mode of the ferromagnet. And that has been seen in previous experiments. So for example, this is um, uh, basically line width. Uh, this is line width of the low frequency mode um, as a function of DC current um, uh, that is applied to a platinum YIG bilayer. Uh, this is data from Olivier's Klein group. And what you see is that by using spin hole current, you can tune the damping uh, in a linear fashion. So one polarity of the current decreases the damping uh, and the other polarity increases the effective damping of the low frequency mode, ferromagnetic resonance mode. So it has also been shown that if you apply a temperature gradient, you can also tune the line width of um, uh, uh, FMR mode in YIG, uh, this was done by In Zong's Wu group. So our goal is to push this uh, process, to push this line to zero, uh, effectively to use this anti-damping uh, uh, torque, which is created by temperature gradient, 
to uh, induce self-oscillations of magnetization in Yig. So and these are the samples that I'm going to talk about. So these are nanowires made out of platinum Yig bilayer. And uh, the thickness of Yig is pretty small, 23 nanometers in this case. Uh, so we uh, pattern nanowires of various width and length and apply, basically fabricate two leads that allow us to drive current through the platinum layer of the nanowire. So the nanowire design, and I will show you, is actually uh, a very good design for studies of uh, uh, thermal gradient effects because in this geometry you can create very large temperature gradients across the thickness of the Yig film. Um, so I'll discuss why this happens. But basically, in this device, when you drive current through platinum, you create a lot of heat, heat in the platinum layer, which has nowhere else to go but through YIG into the substrate. And that generates large temperature gradient. At the same time, of course, you have a uh, spin hole uh, uh, current that is injected into YIG. So you have both spin hole and spin Zabex, uh, Zabex currents at work here. However, you have other um, you know, degrees of freedom to separate these two. For example, you can magnetize the YIG uh, uh, magnetization at different angles with respect to the current flow and uh, the angular dependencies of the effect of this uh, spin hole and spin Zabek current are quite different, which allows you to at least qualitatively separate what's going on. Okay, so first of all, we would like to see if uh, uh, the quality of the interface uh, uh, in our devices, nanowire devices, is good enough if we can have spin current uh, across the interface, non-zero spin mixing conductance. And we can test this, uh, at least initially, through measurements of magnetoresistance. So what is shown here is magnetoresistance of the nanowire for magnetic field applied in the plane of the sample perpendicular to the wire. Uh, at low current bias, you see this uh, bell-shaped curve, which is very characteristic of spin hole magnetoresistance in this system. And that basically tells you that spin hole current can cross the interface between platinum and YIG. So that is uh, good. Now, if we apply large current uh, to the device, 2.75 milliamps, then we are creating a lot of heat in the platinum layer. In this case, we have spin Zabek current, which flows across the interface between platinum and YIG, from platinum to YIG. And um, uh, it has been shown before that this spin Zabek current, in conjunction with inverse spin hole effect, uh, generates um, this type of field asymmetric signal, which can be called uh, spin Zabek magnetoresistance. So all these magnetoresistances are relatively small, but typical for other uh, samples that people studied with good platinum YIG uh, interface. Uh, by good, I mean spin transparent. Now, if we actually, instead of applying DC current, if we just apply microwave current, we also see this uh, spin Zabek signal. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, we demonstrate that this is a thermal uh, voltage which is induced um, across the device. Okay, now. Uh, what happens, uh, um, you know, can we excite and detect self-oscillations of magnetization here? Uh, so our measurement is the following. We apply DC current um, to the nanowire and then we measure microwave voltage which is emitted by this device as a function of DC current. So and we have to do it in a somewhat non-conventional way. The conventional way is that you apply constant magnetic field and then you apply current and you measure emission as a function of frequency. Unfortunately, the magnetoresistance here is very small and the signal is proportional mag to magnetoresistance. Microwave emission from the device is proportional to magnetoresistance. Uh, so we have to use a different method which allows us to measure this very small sub femtowatt microwave power. Uh, so for this, we have to basically fix the, uh, the frequency at which we detect the emission and then sweep the magnetic field, and we also employ magnetic field modulation and lock-in detection to be able to see this small signal. However, when we do that, we see a very clear uh, onset of microwave emission at a well-defined critical current. So below this current, the device does not emit, and above it, it emits. 
Now if you go to very high currents, uh, this signal starts to gradually disappear. Um, and here I can draw analogies with the high power pumping that uh, Burkhardt described. So <coughs> at uh, high pumping levels, uh, uh, you basically can destroy uh, this coherent state uh, and drive the system into uh, the state of just <coughs> overheated magnum gas. Okay, um, so now what we can do, we can measure this critical current for excitation of self-oscillations of magnetization as a function of angle of magnetic field applied in the plane of the sample. So this is the data and what strikes you immediately is that this critical current is a very weak function of the angle of magnetic field. If you only have, uh, let's say, spin hole current and the direction of polarization of spin hole current is fixed, it's independent on the direction of magnetization, then you can make a prediction that uh, the critical current should vary as one over sine of the angle um, uh, the magnetization makes with the, uh, uh, basically <coughs> with the axis of uh, the nanowire. So as shown by this uh, uh, dotted line, dashed line, is what you expect from spin hole alone. Now if you are uh, driving the self oscillations by spin Seebeck current, um, uh, basically, you, sh you don't expect any angular dependence, or the angular dependence should be very weak. Um, uh, the reason for that is that spin current is uh, always polarized, basically, in the direction of magnetization. Right? So as you rotate magnetization, you rotate the polarization of injected spin current. And you can see that in this device, we are basically closer to this regime where um, uh, the critical current is almost flat. So obviously both, um, both effects are at work here, but when you get to uh, basically zero, close to zero angle, uh, it's clear that spin Zeebeck, um, you know, it's, it's clear that spin hole is not the dominant contribution because you would expect very high current here. Um, okay, uh, so self oscillations of magnetization uh, in platinum YIG were also recently observed uh, by uh, Olivier's Klein group in these microscale disks of platinum and YIG. So they also see a sharp onset of self-oscillations and then <coughs> these self-oscillations fade away at high current. In their case, as I will show you, the temperature gradient in this type of device is much smaller than what we have in our nanowire device. And when they measured the angular dependence of the critical current in this material, it closely follows one over sine dependence expected for spin hole. So they define their current as negative critical current, so this curve is flipped. But basically they see spin hole excitation in their devices. So we wanted to know what's different between our devices and their devices. We have done COMSOL simulations, and basically what we see is that in our design the temperature gradient is one order, order of magnitude higher compared to their micro disk design. So this is using the same parameters of the materials. So again, this is consistent with what we expect. Uh, what is different in our case is just much higher temperature gradient across YIG. Now, can we have additional evidence that what we see is actually due to um, uh, spin Zeebeck currents? Uh, the self oscillations are due to spin Zeebeck currents. Well, we know that below the critical current, the prediction is that spin Zeebeck current should act as anti-damping, so it should also change um, uh, the effective line width of uh, the low frequency spin wave that we are driving into the self oscillatory regime. So what we have done, we have used the ferromagnetic resonance uh, method, which is called spin torque ferromagnetic resonance, to measure the spectrum of low frequency modes in the nanowire. So what you see here is the frequency of these modes measured as a function of uh, magnetic field. Um, we can understand these modes, I'll discuss that, but it's also important to note that um, we cannot in this method, we have to, to basically to detect these spin waves, we have to drive the system with microwave current. And this is, a non, is, it, this is basically an invasive measurement because when we apply microwave current to the system, we also heat it up. 
And this is very well seen here in this plot where we measure the line width of this lowest frequency mode as a function of microwave power. The line width decreases with power, which is very unusual for you know, nonlinear magnetic dynamics. But you know, this is not mostly due to nonlinear magnetic dynamics. This is due to the fact that we are heating up platinum and that you know, in the process of measurement, and that basically uh, generates spin Zeebeck current that acts as anti-damping in this case. So we can measure the line width. It's very hard to analyze because this is uh, invasive measurement, but nevertheless, qualitatively, we can get a lot of information out of these measurements. So by the way, we understand the modes that we excite uh, because we can do micromagnetic simulations. We see two types of modes in the experiment, two types of modes in the simulations, and the lowest frequency mode here is actually uh, uh, basically the edge mode of the system of the nanowire uh, and that is this mode that goes um, uh, into the self oscillatory regime. Okay, so now um, we can measure uh, uh, the spectrum of modes uh, by spin torque ferromagnetic resonance as a function of current and we see this parabolic shift. This is due to heating of the system, reduction of saturation magnetization by the heat then we see a jump in frequency at the self oscillatory regime. There is a nonlinear shift from the ferromagnetic resonance frequency of this low frequency mode. But if you look at the line width um, as a function of DC current, we see that you know, for positive current polarity, we have linear decrease of the line width, while for negative par current polarity, the line width is nearly constant. And again, this is very different from what you would expect from spin hole. Remember, from spin hall, what you see is basically increase of the damping for the negative current polarity. So again, this is pretty consistent with our explanation. And by the way, this is uh, the angle uh, at which spin hall is quite significant. This is magnetization nearly perpendicular to the wire. So we interpret this data in the following way. Of course, we are, you know, by applying current, we are creating a um, temperature gradient. We are heating up platinum and we inject spin Zeebeck car current that acts as anti-damping. <coughs> and the important thing is that it acts as anti-damping for both current polarities, right? I mean, negative and positive current heat up the platinum in exactly the same way. However, spin hole, of course, is uh, anti-damping for this current polarity and damping for the negative current polarity. So basically here we have anti-damping from spin hole, from spin Zeebeck, fighting the damping from spin hole, and there is very little change in the line width. And here, basically, both um, uh, spin hole and spin Zeebeck anti-dampings and add up and decrease uh, the line width. Now, if we rotate <coughs> the magnetization close to the nanowire, here the spin uh, hole anti-damping torque is greatly reduced um, uh, proportional to sine of this angle. And, uh, but spin Zeebeck should stay about the same. And indeed, we see that the line width decreases for both polarities of DC current as expected from spin Zeebeck anti-damping. So again, this is consistent with the picture of um, uh, spin hole anti-damping torque. And basically, for these small angles, it's essentially just uh, <coughs> spin Zeebeck uh, anti-damping that drives the system into the self-oscillatory regime. All right, so let me conclude. Um, so we observed current-driven auto-oscillations uh, of magnetization in weak platinum nanowire devices. Um, uh, we observe very weak uh, critical current dependence on the angle of magnetization, which is un very unusual for any spin torque oscillator uh, studied before. Um, in this device geometry, we have very high degree of heating and large temperature gradients, which generates a uh, large density of spin Zeebeck current. And uh, we conclude that auto oscillations in these devices are excited by a combination of spin hole and spin Zeebeck current. And for very small angles of magnetization, it is mainly the spin Zeebeck current that drives the system into the regime of self oscillations. Okay, so thank you.
Okay. Time for questions. So, uh, uh, this is a question of terminology. So, do you draw a distinction between the auto oscillations as you're describing them and uh, and BEC in the previous thought? Uh, well, I mean, by my definition, the condensate is um, basically macroscopic, so large amplitude, and has well-defined phase. Um, so it is most likely, in my opinion, it is the same phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's a condensate, so basically by pumping incoherent magnets into the system uh, at, high, at high density, uh, you start observing this spontaneous formation of this phase coherent state. Okay. Um, you have one plot where the uh, when you change the current polarity, the damping kind of went horizontal when it was negative current. But then you had another plot where you compared the diverging uh, divergence and the plateau, uh, and then that one, the Zabeck effect, seems to be stronger there. Uh, the yeah. Plateauing is sort of showing that there's kind of symmetric effect. Okay, yeah, so yeah, of course the situation is more complicated. And the reason for that is the following. So first of all, <coughs> here, the current is higher than here. So you have more heating actually, because the current is higher. Um, so second, uh, as I said, this is an invasive, well, I mean, this is not invasive, of course, but when you look at spin torque measurements, these are invasive measurements. You have to drive the system very hard to be able to see a signal. So the reason why we, we have to drive it hard because magnetic resistance is small and we don't see the signal when we go to very small drives. So there we drive the system to significant angles. Uh, there are nonlinear effects on the line width as well and there are heating effects on the line width. So quantitative analysis is ki kind of hard. So but there are other um, So why do you do the measure all these experiments at the low temperature, not at the temperature? So there are, there are two reasons. Uh, so first of all, basically, you know, we, we make measurements at 140 Kelvin. What dictates it? Uh, there is a lot of heating. Uh, so basically when we uh, use this temperature and we apply the critical current, the temperature of YIG is pretty close to room temperature. And most other studies of YIG dynamics were done at room temperature. So we wanted to do that. Another reason is that the thermal conductivity of GGG decreases as you go, increases as you go to low temperatures. So and that helps you to build larger temperature gradient. Then you can do at room temperature. Yes. So from your point of view, the appearance of this, the appearance of this phase coherent state, this is a purely classical effect. Is this correct? I mean, what is the role of quantum mechanics? Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid I cannot answer this question. This is a question that is being debated currently, right? So um, you should ask Yaroslav, who is my collaborator. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, in, this, in this example, uh, we actually, you know, the theoretical understanding of this is really textbook BEC. You have a thermal cloud described by Bose Einstein distribution function, not Rayleigh genes. If you use Rayleigh genes, the theory will diverge, everything will blow up because uh, you, know, you have to cut off your yeah. theory somehow. So quantum mechanics basically cuts it off okay. when you're crossing from thermal to quantum fluctuations. That's what Bose Einstein distribution function does. Yeah. yeah, in the end, of course, it's a classical object. Any of these condensates behave as a classical magnetic precession, it's a classical object. Uh, but we here, we think that the underlying physics is actually textbook BC. So you have a thermal plot described by one Einstein distribution function. So another thing which is quite clear here is that this method of detection is completely insensitive to incoherent magnons. There is no microwave signal apart from some low level noise we cannot even detect. So whatever we see is only the coherent part. That would have been my question. I mean, you must have macroscopic quantum state here, right? You must also have supercurrents there because of this ingenious internal field distribution. But you cannot see any fingerprints there, or can you something? 
Well, I mean, it's clear that this is macroscopic mm -hmm. and phase coherent, right? I mean, that's all I can say from the experimental data. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, there are other experiments you could do, and we are working on them mm -hmm. to, to verify if, you know, first of all, if it's really, you know, only the temperature gradient. So, for example, can you ex exclude spin hole? But in terms of, you know, understanding the exact state, I think we have to rely on, on, on theory here. So Yaroslav said that it's basically must be Bose-Einstein condensation. Yeah. <laughs> I believe him. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Yes. The world goes for the coffee, so thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,